This tiny device might be the ultimate way to track just about anything because there's no Tim Cook, no big tech, no monthly cellular subscriptions, and unlike AirTags, it doesn't rely on nearby strangers' iPhones. Just cheap, open source, private, decentralized tracking that actually works. And because this guy is IP65 rated, it means I can do this. Now, I've been watching this space since just about day one, and many of you have been finding all kinds of creative ways to wield this tech, but one common use case kept making its way to the surface. It was in comments such as this. This would be amazing if they put it in a package that could be mounted to a dog collar. And I'm inclined to think that Alien Sasquatch 14 might be onto something. So in this video, we're gonna put this little tracker to the ultimate pet test. We're gonna see if this decentralized open source approach can really give us the peace of mind we're looking for when it comes to our furry friends. And that phrase, peace of mind, definitely hits home for me because I know firsthand the sheer panic of losing a pet. Because this is Riley, and she's just about the friendliest and most intelligent dog you've ever come across. There's only one problem, those legs because when she bolts, it takes just a few seconds before she's out of earshot, which is great for her squirrel obsession, but problematic for keeping her from getting lost. And a few years ago, that's exactly what happened. My brother and I were going on a walk deep in the New Hampshire wilderness, and in a few moments, we realized Riley was nowhere to be found. And I vividly remember the onset of panic and then desperation as we split up and began calling and searching for three long hours. At one point, I backtracked through the trail all the way back to the trailhead, and thank God I found her sitting faithfully at the beginning of the trail. We had both got lucky that day, and I think she knew it. Needless to say, I'm pretty invested in this project. So for a quick recap, this is the T-1000E made by Seed Studio. So originally, it was made for the LoRaWAN protocol, but as Meshtastic, uh, started gaining traction, they kind of upcycled it into a meshtastic device. And yeah, Seed Studio is a Chinese company, which is actually pretty interesting because a lot of the meshtastic tech comes out of China, things like Rack or Helltech or Seed Studio, but China actually isn't a big uh, user base for meshtastic because it kind of operates in a regulatory gray area over there. Decentralized encrypted communication is frowned upon, and also that radio wave is regulated in China. But they don't quite have the experience in the field with these devices to the degree that we do here in the States or in Australia or the UK. Now it feels like I've used just about every Meshtastic device and different devices have slightly different use cases, but as a client, as a mobile portable on the move type device, the T1000E is hands down the best device I've come across. It's IP65 certified, it uses a pogo pin connector, it has long battery life, it has a GPS, and it has LoRa and Meshtastic. So if you were to put this on a dog, I don't think there's much the dog could do to ruin this device. And that includes running through brush or taking a dip in the ocean. But the last mile of the project is getting this device attached to the actual dog. And so that's why I designed the Houdini M1, which is basically a holster for the T1000E. And it should work with any major dog collar. I can show you real quick how to mount this. You just go like this and then you put it down on one side and then you pop it in and you snap on the dog collar. And this thing is not going anywhere, it's in there snug. And the only way you can get it out is by using a very particular motion where you bend it down and then up like that. So I, you know, I don't think this thing's gonna pop out and it should also work with uh, harnesses like this guy right here. You can just kind of find an open part of the strap like right here and then put in one side, put in the second side, 
and you're good to go. Now, I went through a ton of design iterations before landing on this guy. I had this one completely solid. It actually works fine, but it doesn't give uh, enough mobility for the dog. I had a similar design here, different uh, material, and then I landed on this final design, but this is, um, I believe this is PETG. It's very flexible, but for this particular use, we actually want it to be pretty hard. So there's a uh, SLA resin, a magic black material that I, I use with my partners at JLC PCB, and this is just perfect. It's incredibly hard and um, it, it'll do the job and it's not very expensive either. Okay, so I made a video about this a couple weeks ago and people loved it, but there was a little bit of confusion about how this stuff actually works. So I wanna recap and kind of break it down for you so you kind of understand where this fits in the ecosystem of tracking devices and why it's so interesting. So let's start with AirTags real quick because it's kind of the first thing that comes to mind and some people are using it for tracking pets. Even though Apple says specifically it shouldn't be used in that situation. But again, just to recap, so how do AirTags work? They use Bluetooth and ultra wideband. Ultra wideband doesn't go that far. It's really for precise tracking. So like if something's in your house, the ultra wideband helps with that. So when it comes to finding your pet, the ultra wideband doesn't really add much. So let's go to Bluetooth. So Bluetooth has a couple different versions. Uh, currently, the range of Bluetooth is around six, seven, eight hundred feet. And it looks like uh, there might be new versions of Bluetooth that can go a little bit further, but it's not going to be drastic. So you might be thinking, okay, with AirTags, you have Bluetooth and you can kind of track things within maybe say being generous an 800 foot radius. But how does it track luggage halfway across the world? And the way it does that is it uses other neighboring iPhones to ping off of in a proprietary encrypted manner to get the location and then through the internet, send that location back to you. And that actually works all right. But in order for this to work, there needs to be neighboring iPhones. So if you're doing a festival, you know, a national park, uh, search and rescue, hiking, any of these sort of remote off-grid activities, it's just not gonna work. That's kind of the magic sauce that Apple uses to make AirTags work. And then the other obvious caveats are you have to have an iPhone, you have to trust big tech with all that data. And it's kind of weird. You're reliant on strangers, neighboring iPhones. So it's just, it's an interesting application. It might be good for urban settings. And if you like the Apple ecosystem, it could make sense for you, but it's not open source. And there's obvious limitations with that. Now you might be thinking, what about AirTag competitors like Tile and Chipolo and all that stuff. And they use the same approach and it uses its network of, I think, other Tile users essentially to be able to uh, determine the location of one of those tiles. But Tile doesn't have as robust a network as Apple. So right off the bat, you're not gonna get as good coverage. Cause again, it's relying on other people using them and how many people actually use them. And then when it comes to off-grid situations, it's just not gonna work. So if you're cool with the idea of AirTags, but maybe don't have an iPhone, then you could try Tile but your mileage is gonna vary. Now, some of you astutely said, well, my phone has a GPS receiver. So let's talk real quick about how GPS works. You have satellites and they send down waves. And then these little guys can receive those waves and, and get uh, coordinates for your position on earth. It's basically free. Like this, this works with open source just fine. Any sort of GPS device that has one of these will be able to determine a location. And that's all fine but it's the last mile, right? So like if I give this power and I connect it to an MCU, like an ESP32 or something to give it some sort of compute, um, it can get your coordinates, but then what, right? So like if you're trying to track something remotely, how do you then get those coordinates back to you? That's where all this sleight of hand happens with the Apple network and cellular, and even in some cases like Garmin satellite. So actually getting the GPS coordinates is not the hard part, it's getting those coordinates is back to you, that's the tricky part. So now let's talk about products like the Garmin InReach. So the Garmin InReach uh, has one of these GPSs and it also has a proprietary satellite network where it can send messages to the satellite 
and then the satellite can send them to uh, a cellular network, and then the cellular network can send it to like emergency search and rescue or to you with your cellular carrier. But a couple problems with this. One is the Garmin InReach uh, Mini 2, for instance, goes for $399, and then you need a monthly subscription, and that is for the rights to use their cellular network, and that subscription ranges from $15 a month to $250 a month. And I'll even go as far as to say for the Garmin InReach, you have this GPS device, um, and you're able to click an SOS button and it can notify uh, people through the satellite and cellular system, the, the combination of the two. It can notify people that you're lost and it could give them your coordinates. So as a hiker, I don't know if I'd trust it because I would get hypothermia, I believe, long before someone could come and find me. But theoretically, sure, you could send your location to someone uh, remotely and they could at least know where you are and I guess come rescue you allegedly. Although I just I don't see that working in practice as a hiker. That's just me. But but let's let's be generous. Let's be charitable. So Garmin inReach can get your location and it can send it uh, through cellular networks and through satellite networks to people who can do something with it. So it, it can deliver on that. Now, you're not tracking something remotely. You're kind of making your location available to other people. So it's a slightly different use case. But again, it's not open source. You pay monthly subscriptions and you're paying 300 bucks cash on the barrel head just to get the actual device. So you can see why some people might be skeptical. Okay, so finally, off the shelf dog trackers. So you have a number of them and what you'll first notice about them is they're pretty expensive. So uh, I'm just gonna cover the top ones here. So there's one called Spot On and what they try to do is uh, create a geofence. So it's a pretty bulky dog dog collar that you put on the dog and then you can kind of demarcate where you want the dog to go and shockingly the price for this is $999 just for the device which is kind of crazy and this device allows you to set up a geofence and do things like um, shock the dog when it leaves uh, your proximity so it's an interesting usage I'm sure it works in some cases but very expensive and not exactly open source then there's the halo which again is pretty expensive and you have to pay a monthly fee for this uh, ranging from $10 to $20 a month. And then just for some of you, you might be thinking, oh, well I can go on like AliExpress or Temu and get like a dog tracker there. And they will certainly be happy to take your money, but I've done a little bit of research. I bought uh, an AirTag competitor from Temu and I also bought a kind of discreet uh, car tracking device from Temu. And none of these really deliver. This guy uses Bluetooth and it has no proprietary network so all it does is when it leaves the vicinity of your phone so like 300 400 500 feet it can notify you on your phone and this thing can start beeping so yeah you get um, kind of a very close range tracking but as soon as it leaves you don't know where it is and all you know is that it's departed from wherever you are and then there's this guy so this guy has a GPS module in it and it has a slot for a sim card but again you have to kind of broker some sort of deal with a a cellular provider using something like hologram or something like that um, and you're gonna pay monthly for that and frankly I couldn't even get this one to work I don't know if it was a matter of being in China or versus being in the States but this guy just didn't work at all so uh, you know I, I don't think you're gonna find any sort of very very cheap Chinese alternative that actually delivers and then that brings us to Meshtastic so let's step through how this actually works. So again, Meshtastic is using the same sort of vanilla GPS receiver that all the other devices use. So cool, as long as it has a direct line of sight to the sky for the most part, um, it, can, it can acquire your coordinates and, and um, lock onto your location. But how do we then, say we put one of these on a dog and the dog departs and you know runs five miles away from us, how do we then uh, determine where the dog is from like mission control or from home base or whatever and that is where Meshtastic comes in that's where LoRa comes in so these devices use a open source firmware called Meshtastic which relies on the protocol called LoRa. LoRa is a form of radio that is very low power and it is low data. So it's things like text messages, perfect for GPS coordinates, and it can do long range. This is a peer-to-peer -peer network. We're not relying on cell towers. We're not relying on uh, satellite networks or anything like that. 
this talks to this. That is the network. So generally speaking, you know, your mileage is going to vary in terms of range, but I think you can get like three, four, five miles. And the T1000E is hands down the best Meshtastic device that I've used. So in my opinion, Meshtastic is perfect for the homesteading use case. If you have your home and you have a base node and you can just put it outside, I mean, you can put it in your house if you want, but I would put it outside, give it a, a, nice, um, a nice antenna, and you can connect to this from any of your computers in your home. So you'll be able to read the data. You don't have to like put a wire in or anything like that. So you can put this outside and this is your base node, right? And then you throw one of these on your dog and this guy is gonna be able to talk to this as long as it's in a, you know, kind of modest range of, I would say under five miles probably. So as long as the dog doesn't leave uh, a, a radius of about five miles, it's going to be able to um, get the GPS coordinates and relay that back to you and, and you'll be able to put it right on a map. It's all in the Meshtastic software. What if you wanted more range? The beauty of Meshtastic is that it creates a mesh network of all the nodes and it does that automatically. So what you could do is you could set up more base nodes and you can just put the node wherever you want. You could set up an another solar node five miles from your house and that's gonna greatly increase the range of coverage. You can also piggyback off of other nodes in your vicinity. So like here in Miami, as soon as I turn on my device, I see about 30 nodes and all of South Miami Miami is covered. And this node doesn't need to be within range of this node. That's the beauty of the mesh network. As long as there's an intermediary, a relay, this node can send messages to this node through a, a gateway that can um, connect the two essentially. If you want more range, you just grab another Meshtastic device and you'll get more range. And one of the other beauties of this is because it doesn't rely on cell networks or anything like that, it would work in a hiking scenario. It would work in you know Zion National Park, overlanding in a desert, Burning Man, any so sort of use case like that. And you can get fancy with the base nodes. Like you could get a crazy, crazy antenna and have like crazy uh, range for your, you know, whatever you're trying to track. But I just think get one base node initially, get the T1000E, throw it on your dog. And I think that combination is gonna be able to deliver an open source, inexpensive, effective, subscriptionless alternative. Because pet ownership is no walk in the park, but solutions like these help us to give our pets a little bit more freedom and give us a little bit more peace of mind. If you're interested in learning about more killer tech, check out this next video. Thanks.